Good afternoon. Before I begin, I wish to express my thanks to Sismore and to my hosts for bringing me here to be with you. Monotheism, commonly defined as the belief in only one God, has long been thought to constitute one of the hallmarks of ancient Israelite religion. Roman authors singled out monotheism as one of Judaism's admirable features, and it has been identified as a feature of Israelite religion at least by the sixth century BCE. In several older accounts by scholars, such as Albright and Kaufman, monotheism in biblical tradition went back to Moses himself as expressed in the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me, Exodus 20, verse 7, and Deuteronomy 5, 7. For many, if not most scholars, this view of early biblical monotheism has been overstated as monotheism would not acknowledge other gods who would be before Yahweh or besides Yahweh in some translations. Commentators have also pointed to Exodus 15.11 as a less than monotheistic understanding of divinity in Israel since the verse takes note of other gods. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? The older view that monotheism is to be traced back to Moses has been replaced by a historical reconstruction that situates the emergence of monotheistic discourse in the 7th and 6th centuries based on the critical density of monotheistic texts at this time and later. Deuteronomy 4.35, there is no other besides him. Deuteronomy 4.39, the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath, there is no other. 1 Samuel 2.2, 2, there is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. 2 Samuel 22, there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. 2 Kings 19, 15 and 19, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you, O Lord, are God alone. These and other biblical passages, particularly in Isaiah 40 to 55, also called 2 Isaiah, as well as other biblical works, Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Psalms, 86, 96, all of these suggest an articulation of a monotheistic worldview in the 7th and 6th centuries, con this context and later. The term monotheism is not an ancient term, but a modern one. Although the term monotheist is attested earlier in the work of the Cambridge Platonist, Ralph Cudworth, the word monotheism is commonly considered to be the coinage of Cudworth's friend, another Cambridge Platonist, Henry Moore, who lived in 1614 to 1687. He used this term first in his 1660 work quote, uh, called An Explanation of the Grand Mystery of Godliness or a True and Faithful Representation of the Everlasting Gospel of Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The term monotheism developed in the Enlightenment to provide a comparative grid that could map various religions inside and outside of the European context. The same applies to the modern use of the term polytheism, although it appears to be an older term. Apparently coined in antiquity by Philo of Alexandria, polytheism is thought to have entered modern vocabulary first with Jean Bondy in 1580 in French, who used the term in conjunction with atheism. In the 17th century, polytheism was, like monotheism, part of the verbiage of philosophy of religion and interreligious po polemics. Through the 18th and 19th centuries, monotheism continued to serve in scholarly efforts to classify religions worldwide. In this context, religions were labeled according to their forms of divinity. Additionally, these forms were assigned relative value or importance. In this approach, monotheism represented the highest form of religion. This approach to understanding monotheism has been called into question in recent years for seven reasons. First, the word is not a biblical or ancient Near Eastern term, but a modern anachronism. Two, the word monotheism is figured in expressions of Western religious superiority. It is a polemical one, championing Western religion, especially Christianity, over and against non-Western religions. 
Third, monotheism serves to construct a dualistic opposition with polytheism that has shown a tendency to distort or flatten the ancient data, or at least to overstate the contrast. Fourth, it reduces the understanding of divinity to a matter of form, with insufficient regard for the content of divinity or the social and political context that produce such a notion and the practices connected with it. Fifth, monotheism is difficult to define. In the Hebrew Bible, is it a belief, an idea, an abstraction, a worldview, a sort of rhetoric, an element of literary representation, or some combination of these? Sixth, Israelite monotheism is not truly monotheistic since there are other divinities within the religion of ancient Israel. Seventh, and perhaps most crucially, are the biblical texts claimed to be monotheistic truly monotheistic? These are serious objections, and there certainly are limitations to the term. At this point, I would like to address each objection in turn. One, monotheism as an anachronism. Biblical scholars and historians of religion use several anachronistic terms, including Bible, religion, book, and monotheism. Reacting to criticism of using the term religion, Jonathan Z. Smith suggests its positive value when used critically, and these are his words. Religion is not a native term. It is a term created by scholars for their intellectual purposes, and therefore, it is theirs to define. It is a second-order, generic concept that plays the same role in establishing a disciplinary horizon that a concept such as language plays in linguistics, or culture plays in anthropology. There can be no disciplined study of religion without such a horizon. It will not do to argue that the modern sense of the term as a generic term bears no relation to its Latin connotations. It is the very distance and difference of religion as a second-order category that gives its cognitive power. The biblical field uses any number of anachronistic terms, both to serve as entry point into ancient cultures and to gain a critical sense of the distance and difference between the modern and ancient contexts. It serves to highlight the difference between indig indigenous understandings of the ancients, what anthropologists call the emic, and modern interpretations of these indigenous understandings, what anthropologists call the etic. Such a procedure provides a critical basis for probing the modern use of the term in the first place. Number one, monotheism as an anachronism. Biblical scholars and historians of religion use several anachronistic terms, including Bible, religion, book, and monotheism. Reacting to criticism, of using the term religion, Jonathan Z. Smith suggests its positive value when used critically, and these are his words. Religion is not a native term. It is a term created by scholars for their intellectual purposes, and therefore, it is theirs to define. It is a second-order, generic concept that plays the same role in establishing a disciplinary horizon that a concept such as language plays in linguistics, or culture plays in anthropology. There can be no disciplined study of religion without such a horizon. It will not do to argue that the modern sense of the term as a generic term bears no relation to its Latin connotations. It is the very distance and difference of religion as a second order category that gives its cognitive power. The biblical field uses any number of anachronistic terms, both to serve as entry point into ancient cultures and to gain a critical sense of the distance and difference between the modern and ancient contexts. It serves to highlight the difference between indig indigenous understandings of the ancients, what anthropologists call the emic, and modern interpretations of these indigenous understandings, what anthropologists call the etic. Such a procedure provides a critical basis for probing the modern use of the term in the first place. Number two, monotheism used to assert religious superiority. The use of the term monotheism for biblical religion may encourage a modern championing of religious traditions that understand themselves as monotheistic. In addition, monotheism is part of the modern heritage of Western imperialism and colonialism. 
It served as a polemical term and seems hardly a neutral term suitable for scholarly usage. When scholars use the term, they may become complicit in its pol polemical purpose inherent in monotheistic religious traditions. The anthropologist of religion, Daniel Dubuisson, traces monotheistic discourse back to early Christianity and argues that many of the terms used by historians of religion are informed by theology and religious tradition. Dubuisson's discussion suggests that the study of religion may be influenced by the religious traditions that champion monotheism. The question is whether the term can be used critically in discussions of ancient religion. Can scholars reconstruct its usage and critically configure its theoretical framework without em ending up championing Western religious traditions? And will there continue to be subtle influences on scholars anyway? These are serious questions. They are ethical ones as well as intellectual ones. Neat. From an educational and ethical perspective, there is a counter consideration. Avoiding the term monotheism may have the opposite effect of what is desirable, namely critical awareness and discussion. The issue is not simply a scholarly issue. People outside the scholarship know this term. Without some acknowledgement of the term, scholars may miss an opportunity to show the critical issues with the term. One might argue that its familiarity outside of academic settings suggests retaining it as part of the larger academic effort to engage society in a critical manner about ancient religion. The term's familiarity, as well as its problems, arguably provides a teaching moment about the religion of ancient Israel. How the term is handled can serve to educate people professionals and non-professionals alike. In seeing the term's methodological difficulties and the critical considerations faced by modern scholarship, taking cognizance of the term may serve to show the critical issues involved, thereby offering a deeper understanding of the ancient sources bearing on divinity. This is a particular value that scholars should not relinquish too hastily. As a related problem, the polemical cast of monotheism, as it was used in the modern religious context, would seem to be a good reason for not using the term. At the same time, it is to be noted that polemical use of monotheism also marks those texts in the Bible that understands Israel's national god as the only deity in, contra in contradistinction to the deities of other peoples. In other words, the ancient and modern purposes correspond in a notable manner. As is evident from the context of Deuteronomy 4 and 2nd Isaiah that I mentioned earlier, monotheistic discourse emerged as a polemic rhetoric aimed at attacking polytheism within ancient Israel's society and in other societies. <laughs> Thus, it is arguable that the ancient polemical understanding of the term is not ill-fitting. Ill On the contrary, its ancient usage would parallel the modern polemical use for asserting Christianity over and against other religions. Because the ancient usage was in many instances a polemical one, its modern polemical history is not an intellectual reason for discarding it. Instead, these ancient and modern usages would seem to suggest instead that scholars need to recognize its polemical force in both contexts. Number three, the dualistic opposition of monotheism versus polytheism. Many scholars object to the term's dualism as constructed with its counterpart, polytheism. Jonathan Z. Smith regards the two terms as one of, quote, the host of related dualisms, all of which finally reduce to ours and them, end quote. Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza would deconstruct the dualistic categories in these terms, quote, we also have to relinquish the colonialist theoretical model that constructs the relationship between monotheism and polytheism in oppositional dualist terms. Valorizing either monotheism as was done in the colonial period or polytheism as in the case in postmodernism, end quote. 
It is true that the terms monotheism and polytheism construct too sharply a contrast in the ancient data. As we will see below, there is something mono, I use this in quotation marks, in ancient polytheism and something poly in ancient monotheism. Some scholars have noted how the divine council and divine family serve as mono concepts with multiple deities. In turn, scholars are giving thought to the problem of the many within a single deity. Speaking from the opposite end of the theological spectrum as Schussler Fiorenza, Brevard Childs remarked on the way the term monotheism flattens biblical data. Quote, although the historian of religion has every right to employ the term monotheism to the religion of Israel, in contrast to polytheistic religions, the term itself is theologically inert and fails largely to register the basic features of God's self-revelation to Israel, end quote. For Nathan MacDonald, monotheism is an intellectualized or philosophical term of the Enlightenment that does not speak sufficiently to the nature or character of the biblical God. Despite these objections, it may be asked why a single term should be expected to cover the nature or character of any given deity. In short, the past history of the term need not be the meaning that it carries in present or future discussions. As a related objection, it is claimed that in antiquity, monotheism as a term does not make sense until the term developed in opposition to the term polytheism. It is assumed in the scholarly discussions that the use of these terms mars the ancient evidence. Depending on how the terms are used, there is some truth to this claim. At the same time, it is possible to detect the emergence of monotheistic representations of the Bible with older expressions of Israelite polytheism. Deuteronomy 32 is sharply monotheistic, quote, no God, end quote, in verse 21, or, quote, there is no God beside me, end quote, verse 39. Yet this passage contains the older world theology of the 70 gods in verses 8 to 9 in the Greek version and in the Hebrew version in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The opening of the book of Job also uses the older polytheistic mono concept of the divine council along with an assumed single God over all. In other words, biblical texts sometimes stand between the older limited polytheism and the new monotheistic worldview. Even Deuteronomy 4.19, much heralded for its seeming acceptance of polytheism or concession to polytheism, seems to be drawing on the older family worldview of the gods of the nations to explain the idolatry around Israel that Israel must avoid. In short, monotheistic texts in the Bible draw on older polytheistic representations of divinity even as they resituate these within their new monotheistic contexts. Overall, it seems that the objection of the complexity of monotheism and polytheism is suggestive more of an interesting research agenda rather than a reason to discard the terms. Number four, reductionism of divinity to a matter of form. Discussions of monotheism especially when it is praised as the cornerstone of both ancient Israelite religion and modern Western religion, reduce the understanding of divinity to a matter of form. In this approach, Israelite divinity is made into a matter of form, that is, what might be regarded as the problem of reducing any phenomenon to an ism, with little or no reference to its content, that is, what may be regarded as truth claims about a divinity, or attendant praxis. A similar reduction of form, or to form, informs the uncritical correlation of monotheism with violence. For the ancient context, there is no ancient correlation of monotheism and violence. Both ancient monotheism and polytheism entail violence. In fact, it is notable that both monotheism and polytheism use the same sort of terms of violence known as harem warfare sometimes translated as the ban. This tendency toward reductionism also is an underlying issue for the longtime comparison of biblical monotheism with the so-called monotheism of the Egyptian king Amenemophis, 
no, Amenophis IV, better known as Akhenaten. This search was made infamous in modern times thanks to Sigmund Freud. However, the strongly differing content of the so-called monotheism of Akhenaten and Israelite monotheism makes for a dubious comparison. Biblical scholars who use the term monotheism today do not wish to restrict the understanding of any particular deity to the form of theism, but include further understandings about the deity as represented in the primary sources. This has been true for a long time. For example, W.F. Albright and Yechezkel Kaufman did not understand monotheism centered on Yahweh in only general or abstract terms, such as the existence of only one deity. It also included other features, for example, the deity's lack of mythology, sexuality, birth, or death. Despite difficulties incurred by their particular positions, their descriptions show that the use of the term monotheism need not cover all aspects of a deity, but may serve to show a distinctive dimension of that deity's profile. A focus on the form of divinity may also run the risk of ignoring the context of its production or the practices associated with it. A number of scholars, including Nathaniel Levtov and myself, have related the expression of monotheism in Second Isaiah not only to its polemical context. In addition, monotheism in Second Isaiah should be understood in a broader religious and cultural context involving a corresponding set of social and religious practices. Monotheism is only one part of the study of ancient Israelite divinity. It provides a threshold into a broader social and political context for Israel's self-understanding. Just as importantly, monotheism is part of an inner community discussion that forms and shapes the identity of the text's addressees. Number five, defining monotheism. Defining monotheism has been a challenging enterprise as the quest for definition has often been shaped by additional concerns. It has served as a religious belief, even, quote, a sublime idea, end quote, used to distinguish and exalt modern monotheistic traditions. It is clear that it is embedded in biblical text as part of their rhetoric. It is also a central element in the worldview being represented. Defining monotheism is no less a problem because the ancient evidence may give the appearance of fitting poorly with monotheism as commonly defined. This is an area for exploration, but it is to be noted for now that definitional difficulty in itself does not seem to be a strong reason for discarding a term. On the contrary, the more contested the term, the more it is important to dwell on it, probe it, debate it, and not simply to discard it. This issue is illustrated well by the reflections by the anthropologist Clifford Geertz on the problem of defining the word culture. This is Geertz's quote. Everyone knows what cultural anthropology is about. It's about culture. The trouble is, no one is quite sure what culture is. Not only is it an essentially contested concept, like democracy, religion, simplicity, or social justice, it is also a multiply defined one, multiply employed, ineradicably imprecise. It is fugitive, unsteady, encyclopedic, and normatively charged, and there are those, especially those for whom only the really real is really real, who think it vacuous altogether, or even dangerous, and would ban from the serious discourse of serious persons. An unlikely idea, it would seem, around which to build a science, almost as bad as matter. Like the word culture and matter, monotheism is no simple term to define, but difficulty is not a reason to eliminate the word from our scholarly vocabulary. On the contrary, it points up a most central aspect in the scholarly discussion of ancient Israel and thus is all the more reason to study it further, to discuss it, and to debate it. Number six, biblical monotheism as a mistaken claim. The claim that ancient Israel is monotheistic seems misplaced, 
as there are other divinities within the religion of ancient Israel. This objection has gained a great deal of traction in recent discussions. However, the basic issue in this matter is not whether or not Israel's one God discourse was characteristic of ancient Israel in general, but whether or not it is observable in the texts, in the biblical texts of the seventh and sixth century or later. The issue is, in the first instance, a textual issue. How it did or did not work itself out in Israel's society remains part of the research agenda. A further objection sometimes arises as a matter of definition involving the word Elohim, often translated gods or divinities, and its related forms. In other words, if, if other phenomena are labeled by this term, then as the objection goes, there is no monotheism. This approach misses the point about a number of important texts of the sixth century and later. And here I'm thinking of second Isaiah, Isaiah, that is Isaiah 40 to 55, Ezekiel and Genesis 1, among others, and the claims that they're making about Yahweh vis-a-vis -vis other deities. For these texts, Yahweh is the only one that is indispensable in the picture of reality, that other forms of divinity are at best relatively minor and only make sense with Yahweh as the God beyond their power, that they only have agency thanks to this one deity permitting them or giving them power. In other words, from the perspective of such authors, if Yahweh is removed from the picture of reality, then the picture of reality does not stand. And this is the case across a wide range of biblical texts in this period. Number seven, the ongoing debate about the biblical texts claimed to be monotheistic. Some scholars object that the term monotheism does not really fit the ancient textual evidence that is said to be monotheistic. Nathan McDonald complains about the term's appropriateness for characterizing certain biblical expressions as found in the passages cited earlier. These, for McDonald, are to be viewed not as claims to a single deity in reality, but instead as <coughs> statements about Israel's singular allegiance to one God. It seems that despite some well-placed criticisms, both points are embedded in these biblical expressions. The overall picture in these texts represents all reality as dependent on this one deity. Furthermore, there are other biblical texts that represent other deities as lifeless or missing from the picture of reality. These two presuppose a monotheistic worldview or what in the next part of this presentation I call one divinity discourse. To my mind, as long as scholars bear in mind the problems with the term monotheism, especially its modern role in asserting Western superiority, the term will continue to help the wider world enter into the important questions of religious thinking that monotheism serves to raise about the nature of divinity, humanity, and the world. Thankfully, more recent scholarly discussions have provided a historical contextualization of Israelite monotheism that helps to counteract the potential abuses of the terms. Beginning in the 1970s, efforts have been made to locate biblical monotheism in the wider context of the ancient Near East. Ancient Mesopotamian texts that represent other deities as the manifestations of one god or goddess came to be compared with biblical representations of monotheism. Biblical monotheism may be situated within the larger context of what I would call ancient Near Eastern one deity discourse. And perhaps biblical monotheism represented a response specifically to Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian imperial forms of one deity discourse. In several Mesopotamian texts, a number of major chief deities are represented as the embodiment of all the other deities, or the other deities are representations of aspects of the one deity. In addition, social and political developments within Israel in the seventh and sixth centuries came to be seen as influential in the development of Israelite monotheism. I have emphasized how a shift in social identity 
from the collective to the individual as the primary form of self social identification may inform the shift from the collective of multiple gods and goddesses as the divine family and divine assembly to the individual god or what has come to be called monotheism. These developments are important and these have issued not only in a new understanding of Israel's central God, but also in the nature of divinity itself. Israelite monotheism does not just redefine the profile of the older traditional Yahweh Ale, it also redefines divinity. First and foremost, all positive divine power and character resides in this God or Godhead. Whatever can be said positively about divinity in ancient Israel can be predicated only of Israel's God. In turn, other divinity is abolished. The older middle levels of divine hierarchy are eliminated. The sun, moon, and the stars are no longer divinities. Angels are no longer regarded as minor divinities. The old motif of the 70 gods becomes 70 angels. Divine military retinues are also identified as angels. For example, the angels in Genesis 19.1 are called destroyers in Genesis 19.13. The divine council or assembly was viewed as populated only by angelic sons of God in Job 1-2. In other words, sons of God, formerly important members of upper divine hierarchy, are demoted to angels, and the divine council becomes a new vehicle or stage for theological reflection on divine agency of a single deity. Again, Job 1 to 2. The language of divine family becomes residual. In sum, there was a total polarity between the top and bottom of divinity, such that the bottom is no longer recognized as defined with angels as a category between divinity and humanity. Oneness of divinity is located in a single divine figure, with the remainder being angelic figures drawing the reality from the single one, in metaphysical language participating in its ontology. As a corollary, all deities apart from Yahweh were defined in utter opposition from Yahweh. In short, they are redefined precisely as other gods. The roots of this development can be seen already in the separate worship of Yahweh expressed in the Ten Commandments noted at the outset of this talk. Stated differently, other deities became, regular, be, became regarded as absolutely other from Yahweh and as not deities, as illusions or nothing. For second Isaiah, God, and not Marduk, is the super god in the universe. Isaiah 46.1 mentions Marduk under the title Baal as nothing other than a lifeless idol that weighs down those who carry it, unlike the living God who bears up the house of Jacob, whom this God has created. This is in verses 3 to 4. I would emphasize that there is no comparable notion expressed in any other ancient Near Eastern culture as far as I know. This approach to other gods is consistent with the Bible's generalization of the names of some deities, such as Astarte as a term for fertility of flocks, Reshef as flame, and Dever as pestilence. This also goes with the denial as other gods as not being Israelite. See, for example, the labeling Baals and Asherot and Ashtarot in Judges chapter 2 and 3, or Baals in 10... 10 of Judges and Hosea 11.2. In addition, there emerged claims that older traditions formerly associated with Yahweh did not belong to Yahweh, such as the denunciation of Asherah and also of the sun, moon, and the stars. Similarly, symbols were divorced from other deities. Asherah was no longer regarded as the symbol of the goddess, but as a symbol of Yahweh, his Asherah and also as a symbol of the divine Torah. Note the possible wordplay on the Asherah in Proverbs 3.18. With other gods defined as not gods, the redefinition of divinity had further repercussions. 
Former divinities move from the category of the uncreated to the created order. First, the sun, moon, and stars were no longer viewed as lower level divinities, but as created, as in Genesis 1.16 and Psalm 148. Second, angels were no longer regarded as lower level divinities, but as created, Nehemiah 9.6, Psalm 148, see also Jubilees 2.1. Third, Cosmic waters were no longer divine, much less personified, as in Psalm 104.7, but as created, Psalm 148 and Jubilees chapter 2. Fourth, cosmic enemies such as Leviathan are represented as created, Psalm 104 verse 26. The overall result seems to be a total polarity between other gods as non-divine versus total individuation of divinity in Yahweh and also of notions of divinity in Yahweh. For purposes of contrast, we may note that in one Mesopotamian text, the gods being created does not necessarily mean that the gods are not gods. In a Sumero-Babylonian incantation, the god Marduk, quote, made the Anunnaki gods, all of them, end quote. Being created, in this case, does not make the other gods into non-gods. This representation contrasts with the biblical situation where the creation of the formerly divine entities does seem to mark their status as non-divinities, which also fits with the biblical notion of the other gods as non-gods. In biblical texts, being created does seem to constitute a lack of divinity for these beings. On page 18, names of deity and all the roles properly identified for divinity in these biblical representations constitute a single reality of a single deity. The result is not simply, is not simply a concentration of divine names, titles, and powers in a single deity. There are also the other remaining divine entities ultimately understood as having reality thanks only to this divine entity. The important corollary of this situation is that the one divine entity bears the range of character found elsewhere spread across a number of deities. And no less importantly, this deity has the range within the divine self or person. In other words, this deity is not more divine only in encompassing various divine characteristics. This deity is sometimes represented as more human than before in encompassing the divine personalities seen across the range of other deities. The biblical God, and here I consciously am not suggesting that this is entirely the same as the Israelite God, seems both more divine and more human compared with earlier versions of this God and per perhaps compared with other deities. If one may speak of a revolution of ancient Israel's deity it may involve the unity of not only the deity's roles and functions, but also the personality of the deity in the full range of divine and human roles that deities may exercise. There is not only one divine person, there is also only one order of divine personhood, both coterminous in the biblical God. Thank you.